<laughs> okay, um, first of all, hello, uh, welcome. Um, my name is Kostin Lau, and today I'll be talking about uh, sort of Hadoop and big data from the perspective of a Java enterprise developer. So I'll do a quick crash course through Hadoop, see what Hadoop is, uh, MapReduce, talk about Hive and Pig and Cascading and HBase, uh, go beyond sort of the funny names and see what's actually there, and uh, look at a sort of Hadoop as a big picture. Not just what big data in Hadoop is, but how can you actually work with it, again, from the perspective of a Java enterprise developer? That is, how can you actually adjust this into your, into your architecture? How can you extend your application, see what challenges are out there, how you can deal with that, how sort of raw or vanilla Hadoop usage looks like, how you can improve that, and also look at what we call uh, big data pipelines. That is, streaming data into Hadoop, um, analyzing it, and then pushing it out. A bit about myself, I've been working at uh, Interface 21 for, well, <laughs> when I joined, I, it was called Interface 21 for uh, seven years now, now nowadays it's called Spring Source. I've been working on various uh, projects. For the last two years, I've been working on Spring Data on uh, Gemfire, Redis, and leading the Spring Hadoop project, which I'm going to uh, mention in this presentation. So before getting into actual... Um, you know, into the actual topic and seeing some code and seeing the actual challenges. Let's set up the context, which is actually quite relevant. So, um, in the last 10 years or so, we've been producing a lot of data, digital data. There are some interesting numbers on there, and uh, for example, this one here uh, says that we have about 1.8 trillion gigabytes in about 5 quadrillion files. That's a lot of data, and apparently based on uh, what we've been doing in the last decade or so, every two years or so, we more than double the existing amount of data around us. So that's quite a lot of data. But what does the data represent? Well, if you break down into what you have in, within the enterprise, and this is just a statistic from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics from 2009, so potentially it's just U.S. specific and um, maybe a bit stale, you see some interesting figures. We have three columns here. The one on your left-hand side basically talks about the uh, amount of data which is stored per sector um, by each company. So you see the numbers there is actually given in petabytes, and you see the top three is made up of discrete manufacturing, government, communication, and media, which is probably what you expect. Then the uh, column in the middle says, well, how big are these companies? Companies that have more than 1,000 employees. So then you can see that the numbers change a bit. And then the right-hand column represents the number of data stored per company. And this is where we have a bit of a different story. You notice that security and investment services actually have the most data stored, data retained per company, which actually makes sense, right, because of all the uh, policies and uh, the regulations out there and the sensitive data nature of the, of the data. You still have communication and data, government, and also utilities. Now, the bottom line is there is that 15 out of 17 sectors within the United States store more data than the U.S. Library of Congress, which is, in general, seen as a reference of vast amount of data. And that's about 320 terabytes of data. Some companies store a lot more than that, petabytes. Now, if you have to break down that data that is stored into sort of hot items, what are the hot resources that are being stored, you'll see that you have, you know, the usual suspects such as video, images, audio, right, it's things that take a lot of space. But most of the data being stored is actually text and numbers. We're looking here as at un, um, unstructured data, right, because each company has its own resources, uh, emails, data format, so there is no predefined model, there is not one unified store, like an initial database where you can store this data. And besides the actual data being stored, you also have sort of incidental data. That is, as if the data is being archived, potentially is being um, aggregated, you have some sort of counters or sort of analysis, maybe indices being stored along with the data, so it's easier to retrieve or potentially have some very simple analysis being done, so later on you can very, very easily look through it. So 
within the enterprise, you don't just have a lot of data being stored and being accumulated, but actually data that can be very easily searched, right? We're talking about, again, text and data. Now, you also have some interesting trend. This is something that you've been hearing about for a long time, actually, since sort of personal computers have become mainstream, and that is the cost of hardware is more than half every one year and a half, every 18 months. That is, with the same amount of money, one year later, you can buy a lot more powerful hardware. And what does that mean? Well, because when you're talking about a lot of data, potentially you need a lot of storage, a lot of CPU resources to, trunk, to crunch all that data. Right? Previously, you would look at a big box, what is called big iron, but nowadays, actually, you can buy a lot of commodity hardware, potentially assemble them in the clusters. So you can actually scale out rather than uh, scale up, and obviously, the cost is going to be cheap. So what does it exactly mean? Well, it means that the value from actually storing the data um, creating all this infrastructure around it has actually exceeded the, the cost for hardware and software. We're looking at an inflection point. Previously, you had big company, big names like Amazon, Google, eBay, right, that had a lot of information aggregated out there, and for a simple reason, because you're reflecting on the bottom line, right? The more information they got from the customer, the, the better they understand what the customer wanted. However, they could also absorb this cost of creating the infrastructure. But nowadays, we're looking at this inflection point where actually average companies can actually have the same infrastructure, potentially the same benefits, and obviously improve their bottom line by tapping into data, by actually doing the analysis, right, without burning their funds for uh, one year or so. So we're, I keep talking about this uh, term, and probably you've heard it before, big data. What exactly is it? Well, it's about a huge data set that cannot easily fit into what uh, nowadays we can consider sort of mainstream or standardized solutions for storing, simply because it's way too big. So storing that data, analyzing it, looking at it, getting results out, it's just way too big, so you have to find some other means. And if you look throughout the industry, you'll see that the range um, is somewhere between tens of terabytes to petabytes or even higher than that, depending on how big the company is. So what exactly is a big data pipeline? You know, this is how does a big data architecture look like? And this is where I've I used my awesome drawing skills uh, to make this happen, to create this fancy drawing. It's not something really new, actually. I would argue that most of you have actually encountered something like this before. So what we have here is, if you look again from the top of your left-hand side, is you have sort of sources. Right, sources that produce data. And this is, again, very subjective because it depends on what sort of uh, data is being produced by your company, by your environment. It can be anything from actual data that resides within the database, in-transit data such as messages on JMSQ, uh, potentially monitoring of your network, anything from cache hits, cache misses, um, network load, um, hardware and CPU load as well, to analytics such as how many users do I have on my website, what are the popular items, what are the hot images or items out there, emails, anything and everything that is of interest to you or potentially later on can be of interest can be seen as a source of data that can be retained and then later on looked at. So if that data comes in, you need to store it somewhere. This is where you'd have your big data store, which is right there at the bottom. It's called unstructured data. Now, if the data flows in, you can actually do some analysis on it. This is where you have these wheels there, which is called the real-time processing. That is, as the data flows in, you can potentially look at it. You can do simple things like uh, look some, for some counters, potentially look at some hot items, and put them into um, stores such as um, Redis or Gemfire, or do something like that, uh, something more do actual analysis. Once the data is being stored, you can start doing analysis. Now, one interesting uh, thing here is everything with big data tends to be batch-related because we're talking about a huge data set. It's not something that potentially can do right away. So if you want to go through this whole working set, because it's so large, you have to do it in a batch. That is, you have to start the process. It's going to take a long time. And that's not something that most people are happy with. So that's why typically you have a store in front of that, where you can store information that usually is hot, that you want right away. So you can do this long-term analysis, then put the results there, so later on you can actually query that fast store and get the results faster than having to start the whole batch again. So this is what you have there on the right-hand side, where you have things like Big SQL, that is, uh, SQL engines that actually understand big data. You can do this batch, and, uh, batch processing through Hadoop, typically, and put it into the analytic engines where it gets your results from. So what we're looking here now is literally an integration, typical integration problem. Uh, there, the sort of the strip 
uh, blue line there represents uh, what we like to call sort of the big seven steps, which is right, collecting the data, doing transformation, potentially some real-time analysis, the actual ingestion or storing of the data. And once the data is there, you start doing analysis. And again, because this is big data, you do a batch analysis, and then we distribute it and store it. Uh, why is this an integration, classical integration problem? Well, because you have different sources of data, different type of formats, you have to store it somehow, right? You have different workflows, event-driven, depending on your source, potentially batch when you're doing the analysis. So really, there is no silver solution, no silver bullet solution here. There's this interesting uh, paper for those that are interested into sort of the uh, knee-deep uh, gory details called One Size Fits All, an idea whose time has come and passed, written by Michael Stonebreaker, who's one of the granddaddies of uh, racial databases, uh, used to work on Cybes, one of the authors of uh, Postgres, and now working on VoldB, where he sort of uh, breaks down uh, the whole model that I've uh, mentioned before, and his idea is that right, right now we have a, a nice abstraction as we look in on the actual data being moved from one side to the other, but actually because of the sheer scale of things, we cannot just use the same solution, but actually we end up with different components, each doing one specific task, very good, but just only one. So you cannot just use the same component over and over again. So you end up basically with different actors that have to play together, and it's up to you to, to choose what these actors are. Now, the statement that I'm going to make, subliminal, I guess, in this presentation, is that for the most part, actually, Spring Projects can help you a great deal whenever you have to use big data. So uh, what, okay, you have big data, so how can you actually work with it? As I said, it's a very generic and sort of moving target, but one de facto uh, standard, if you like, solution for big data is Hadoop, and that it acts as a platform. So this is what typically you have with Hadoop. What exactly is Hadoop? The two boxes in blue right there at the bottom. Right? As I mentioned, big data is about a huge amount, vast amount of data. It's not something that fits into one machine. Actually, you have to split it across multiple machines. So you need, obviously, to handle that. You need the infrastructure to store your data in several machines. If one machine dies, you have to do something about that. If you want to add more machines, you have to deal with that. So obviously, there is a lot of sort of, you know, gory details in there. And Hadoop gives you that. Is the HDFS, or Hadoop Distributed File System. It gives you this nice abstraction, right? Because, again, there is no unified model it means you need sort of the lowest common denominator, and that's a file system. You can store whatever you want in there. There is no schema, nothing. It's entirely up to you. And behind the scenes, the whole setup, the whole communication between the different machines is handled by Hadoop. So only, only, the only thing you have to do is add a machine, uh, start Hadoop on it, and that's it. The whole setup uh, is done for you. Now, now that you have all this big data being stored, you have to analyze now, obviously, you can do this with one machine, but probably that's going to be highly inefficient. So ideally, you need more than one machine to look at this. And this is where you could use the same cluster that stores the data. And that's because, obviously, they have a lot of insight into where the data actually resides, data locality, things like that. So rather than moving data around, you can actually move code around. And this is what the MapReduce framework is. It is a very simple, uh, but yet highly parallelized concept in which you can do um, basic things. A map reduce literally stands for divide, divide and conquer, or divide and pair, or scatter together. Now, map reduce is efficient, but unfortunately, it's also low level. As, as you'll see, Hadoop tends to be pretty um, infrastructure based. So that's why, on top of that, you tend to have various abstractions. And so, where you have cascading, a pig, hive, and age base. These are the uh, sort of most common uh, projects. Most of them are actually reside as Apache uh, Foundation as well. And then you have the guide there. Um, on the left-hand side, which is a zookeeper. This is an infrastructure service. Typically, you don't interact with it, but it's a service that usually takes care of the different uh, nodes within your cluster. It's something that you can use or not. Most people choose not to. So where does Spring for Hadoop comes in here? Well, because um, Hadoop tends to be infrastructure-based. It has a very poor out-of-the-model uh, program, um, programming model, out-of-the-box programming model. In fact, most of the things are actually directed at the command line, which is not something that the average developer is going to use. Rather, you're going to use an ID, potentially uh, some JVM. Uh, so what we're looking at is simplifying the development. So whether you're using um, you know, pig, hive, cascading, whatever your use cases are from interacting with HDFS to doing things like workflows, integration, the idea is to have the same consistent programming model. So whatever uh, weapons of choice you use, you still end up with the same 
a nice, consistent environment. It's basically about allowing you to start small and then growing organically rather than to have to make a front, uh, any big investment up front. This is sort of a uh, big picture, how it looks like. You have sort of Spring for Apache Hadoop. We handle there the Hadoop part, but we integrate for the most part with the rest of the projects. Spring Framework uh, for doing container and wiring. Spring Data, whenever you want to talk with JPA, such as repositories or NoSQL uh, data source, anything from key values like Redis to MongoDB, Neo4j. Uh, for Batch, uh, we support uh, Spring Batch to do on and off workflows, as you'll see, and if you still have time, uh, also talk about Spring integration. This is especially useful whenever you you have to deal whenever you have to integrate Hadoop into your application because typically you have to deal with events. So in terms of capabilities, we're looking at sort of two main uh, stories right now. Uh, we're approaching GA in December next month. Uh, the first one is declarative configuration, very easily to get started. Whether you want to do is, uh, use vanilla Hadoop or want to use Pig and Hive. Um, configuration in, in a way that can be easily extended, maintained, and parallelized, because most of the Hadoop infrastructure right now is actually based on scripts. So you have sort of a spaghetti code, uh, all sort of scripts, anything from Python to Ruby to your jars, which are hard to maintain, especially as your team grows and as your application grows. And also, make sure that your application is something that is understandable. Uh, again, whether you're interacting with HDFS or potentially want to use things declaratively or in a programmatic manner, you should have the same consistent API. And you'll see also a sort of uh, common suspects like templates for pig, hive, and hbase. So let's take a look at how Hadoop actually uh, looks like. As I mentioned, the core um, unit of work here is the MapReduce framework. MapReduce basically means if you have a big problem which is too big to solve or takes too much time, you're going to chop into small pieces and then each piece is going to be done in parallel and once you have all the results, you're going to aggregate it. That's theoretically how it works like. Again, um, scale together, divide and uh, conquer, divide and impera, that sort of strategy. So what we're doing here is we have this big chunk of data inside our cluster, then de depending on the number of nodes, or basically depending how fast we want to solve that problem, we allocate some number of nodes. Each node is going to pick a chunk, is going to work on it, is going to send the results, the reducer is going to make sure it does the aggregation, and there we get the actual results being written down to the file system. Now, in MapReduce or in Hadoop, hello world, is counting words. It's not really funny to, um, or useful in a cluster to have a hello world appearing on all the stations, right? So typically you would count words. Why? Because it's a basic problem that um, sort of perceives or illustrates how well the uh, parallelism nature works. You have a big book, right, or a big file. You can either uh, count all the words by one machine, but potentially you can chop into pieces and then each node is going to to count the words, and then you go into the aggregation. So this is how it looks like. This is the actual result taken, uh, actual example taken from the documentation. I've tried to arrange it here. The formatting isn't exactly great. Um, what I have there in bolded uh, text fonts are actually the relevant work. Uh, the rest is sort of fluff. This is where you extend or some interfaces, some classes, because you have to use the MapReduce framework, you have to do some setup, stuff that actually is uh, incidental complexity, basically, to your application. So what we're doing there inside the mapper, we're using a string tokenizer, so the data comes in line by line. We're going to take each string, going to tokenize it, have the words, send them to the reducer. The reducer is going to count the occurrences of each word and is going to write that down to what is called their context. Now, you probably understand what's going on, but you might be wondering, why do I do this? Why do I have to split the words and then send them to the reducer? Why do I do the counting inside of the reducer? And this is where sort of the semantics of the simple models start to show um, their head, and that is the MapReduce framework in its contract says that each mapper can split the content into keys, and then the keys, by definition, are going to be sent in order to each reducer. So rather than having different reducers counting different words and potentially doing some sort of clashes, each reducer is going to receive the same keys, basically, the same set in order. So as you can see, there are some interesting things there that you have to uh, uh, you know, consider, and again, the code looks, well, a bit low level. That's why, as you see, there are most people tend to prefer to use other tools that are very easy to sort of adapt to bigger scenarios. Now, once you have your mapper and the reducer, um, again, it's taken from, the, config from uh, the Hadoop example, you typically have to create a configuration. That's basically where you instruct what your code looks like. And this is where you say, well, this is my mapper, this is the reducer, this is where my cluster is, this is where my input for my mapper and the reducer is, this is where the output is. Basically, this is where the data resides, this is where I want, 
uh, pushed it out. Again, I've sort of put in black there the things that are relevant, and that is the configuration that tells you where your actual cluster is, and then the input and the output. The rest is incidental. Why? Because you pretty much define things that are already there, such as this is the mapper, this is a reducer. I have some uh, small things like output key uh, class and value class, input format and output format. Again, these are things that are already expressed within your mapper and the reducer. And that once you have that, basically you have to start your jar. And again, Within the example, typically you would run things from the command line. You have the Hadoop command line, where you say, this is my jar that contains the mapper and the reducer, the configuration. I'm going to invoke things from the command line. At this point, my jar is going to be sent to the cluster. Based on the configuration, the mapper is going to be spread, and then you're going to actually do the execution. Now, from a programmer, using the command line when you want to do things is not ideal. Is we're talking here about an external process that has to be uh, started, yet you don't have a lot of insight and control. So ideally, you'd have something within your application, right? Some sort of API that's ne nicely configured. So one thing that we did here in Spring for Apache Hadoop or HTTP, as we do there, is to make things very easy in a declarative fashion. That is, once you write the code, you don't necessarily have to tell us again what you did there, because potentially we know this already. So what you have there is just um, uh, HDP is a sort of the Hadoop namespace where, first of all, you declare the configuration. This is just a one line where we read the defaults. And once we have that configuration, we can use that for all the Hadoop components out there. So, for example, we declared a jar runner, which does exactly that. It's going to run a jar based on uh, your Hadoop configuration. So we can take the Hadoop example. This is our actual um, jar from the Hadoop distribution. We just take the arguments as we have in the command line and you run it. And again, this is something that is defined within your application. You don't have to start things from the command line. This is entirely under your control. Um, you can also sort of improve things. This is another example where count where rather than just relying on the uh, configuration that's specified within your Hadoop cluster, you can actually specify one by yourself. This is what my Hadoop site sort of mentions. This is a Hadoop configuration where rather than relying on the default, you specify there an additional cluster, positioning some properties, and you send that along with your jar. So the jar runs in a specialized context. And again, we support that as well. You can see there two runner again specify the work count input and the output, potentially some parameters, and that's it. Notice that at this point, we don't necessarily have to specify word count, things like that, because we can try and use sensible defaults, such as if you have specified a jar, we know you, you need a tool. So we're going to uh, identify the main class, take a look where it implements a tool, wiring the configuration, and, and then run your tool. Right? Small things that allow you to start working with it without having to write jars, without having to write code, just get started with it with the examples out of the box. Now, speaking of configurations, you can go crazy with it. Um, and that's typically the case, because each environment has a lot of settings. Uh, we have first class support for that in Spring for Apache Hadoop for configuring um, Hadoop and various jobs. So for example, what we did here is, uh, again, the HDP configuration. What we're doing there is override the default configuration by specifying the cluster. So rather than relying on an external file, I can just define that within my application. I can specify with FS default name where the HDFS file system location, meaning host and port, is going to reside. You can also specify the job directly. So you can get rid of that configuration file entirely and just specify, well, this is my job, right? This is a jar mapper, reducer input, and output path. And this is where sort of streaming into the other Spring projects is starting to make sense. Um, rather than hard coding the input and the output as we did before, or as you typically do within your configuration, you can use Spring property placeholder, right? Which allows you to externalize these values that are environment specific from your application configuration. So rather than changing that every time or potentially duplicate that for every job type, you can just put that onto a file and then just modify that external file based on your environment. And this is what we're doing here. I'm just using properties placeholder to externalize input and the output uh, path within uh, my files here. And again, I'm using a job runner. So we you know, simply migrated from a jar base, which is just a Hadoop file, to configuring everything within your environment. You can also use what is called streaming. This is basically using mapper and reducer through the um, um, various scripting languages like Python or Ruby it tends to be quite popular with the analysts simply because a lot of data scientists have a lot of tools within Python for dealing with numbers. So it's easy for them to just pull the scripts within uh, the Hadoop environment. And typically, again, you would do things from the command line. You have Hadoop, jar. In this case, you specify a jar that's provided out of the box. Hadoop streaming, specify the arguments. So 
dealing that and you know integrating all that into your applications tends to become this number of batch scripts that you have to execute, which tends to be hard. This is something else that again we support out of the box with HDP for the streaming namespace. And one thing here is you know um, we're still using the Propsys placeholder, but we can take things a bit further by using Spring 3.1 uh, property environment abstraction. That is, we can have our file here uh, that uses sort of a dev dev development environment. I have a Hadoop installed locally. Everything is on my machine, so I'm just running simple scripts to make sure it happens. And then if I want to move, for example, to QA, I can just do that by specifying this um, environment property and QA there. Uh, at the bottom to literally tell Spring, well, in this case, you have to pick this script or the settings. Again, adapting on top of the environment. So your application looks like a blueprint. Based on the environment, you can very easily externalize things without having to do things by hand, without having to do all sort of ifs and various hacks within your scripts. So something that is very maintainable and understandable and under your control. Now, um, so far, I've used sort of the Hadoop examples where you have a jar, everything externalized, and then you start things from the command line. Now, typically, within your application, you don't do that. You don't just go in and say, star my job. Typically, you either schedule it, you say every time at midnight, run something, or you react to something, such as I have, uh, I don't know, one terabyte of data coming in, it's enough, I have to start it, right? Um, for the most part, because here we're talking about Spring, we're talking about Bean, so basically POJOs, and that's exactly the case here with Hadoop jobs as well. Whether you're talking about streaming or any other type of jobs, you still have the fundamental job type, which you can just use dependency injection, get it, and then decide what to do with it. So you can use Spring to configure the whole thing, then inject it and decide what to do with it programmatically, as we do here. In this case, we're just spinning things by hand. A common case with Hadoop is dealing with HDFS, the file system. And that's because you have a lot of data around, typically you have to say, well, before I start my job, which is going to take anything from five minutes to potentially uh, one month, I have to figure out whether my files are in proper order, whether I have the proper permission set, do I have the opt folder, if it's there, potentially move it, because I don't want to override, because then I have to potentially spend another month uh, getting the previous results. So typically, again, with Hadoop, you have what is called a shell. Uh, this is exactly what you expect, a simple shell where you can run from the Hadoop command line things like make directory, test whether something there, change permissions, list, things like that, again, from the command line. So the developer, you typically want to interact with it, and you have to then go through a lot of hoops uh, to make that happen. So one thing that we did is expose the file system API, but also the shell as a first-class Java API, something that you can use. So you can actually use Java code against it. This is just FS shell, what the API looks like, so you can use all the commands that you have from the command line here within your Java code, and rather than getting all sort of messages that you have to decrypt, you actually have exception that tells you what's wrong. And again, the semantics are exactly the same. We use the command line underneath the scene. Now, since we're talking about scripting, rather than using Java, potentially you want to use a scripting language. And because these things are exposed as first-class citizen within Java, they're basically available to any language running on top of the JVM. So obviously it makes sense to use a scripting language with scripting. So you can use Groovy, you can use um, Rhino, meaning JavaScript, JRuby, Jython. Basically you can take your scripts that typically previously were written in order to interact with HDFS and use them and make them available within your application. So I'm showing here just sort of the same uh, script that I've seen before. In this case, I'm using Groovy, so you can see I'm using this uh, implied or already bound variable, FSH. This is a file system shell that gets available, um, that is exposed to your script. So simply because you declare the script automatically gets wired to the Hadoop environment. We already know this is a script that runs inside Hadoop, so we can automatically do the wiring, expose the shell, and make it available to you. So what I'm doing here is a typical thing, which is test whether the folder is there. If it's, if it's not, make a directory, copy the data into it, change the proper permissions, and then run it. And the ninth thing is the same script can be the local or can just be declared within your application. So what I'm doing here is declaring the script, again specifying the language because I cannot automatically detect it and potentially even bind out some variables to it. So rather than passing things uh, with a hard-coded value, I can actually parameterize them and then I can have the same script running within different environments. Again, notice I don't have to do any explicit wiring. We already tried as much as possible to help you. This is a script running inside Hadoop, so we can already set up the environment for you. Now, moving over from sort of Hadoop, most people tend to look at more 
or higher level tools that give you better abstractions. So write, rather than writing what you, some call sort of the assembler of MapReduce, which is a MapReduce framework itself, you can use tools like PIG. Right, fancy name, um, fancy icon there. And what PIG is a data flow language. That is, you define the input, and as the data goes in, you can basically apply operations on it. So this is the same counting words, but notice here I'm writing an actual script. So what I'm doing there is the same thing, right? The uh, things in, um, with bolded fonts are what actually matters. I'm loading the data from uh, the file system, HDFS. I'm looking at it as a bunch of lines. So what I'm doing is going to apply tokenizing, uh, for each line, I'm going to chop it by um, actual words. So I'm removing the spaces and then doing a group by, and then for each group, I'm going to actually do the counting. So it sort of looks like SQL, but it's not SQL, right? And again, PIG tends to be quite popular simply because it allows people to interact uh, with big data through a declarative language rather than uh, writing MapReduce. So the usage, typical usage, is what you expect. Again, things are from the command line. So you have to write your script, any parameters, any configuration that you have to use, you have to specify that from the command line. Right? That's ugly, especially if you're a developer. So with Spring for Apache 2, we do the same thing. We allow you to create what is called a pig server that basically define how your pig infrastructure looks like. You specify everything in a central place. And um, moreover, you can run scripts as startup. So for example, whenever you have some user-defined function or you want to register some actual jars that provide extra functionality, you can do that there. This is also important because typically pig server um, is not thread safe. So every time you have to invoke it, you have to create a new instance because otherwise uh, your scripts are going to not run properly. So what, we, what I'm showing here is sort of how you would run scripts in a declarative manner. I have the pig factory there at the top where I'm defining, okay, these are the properties. This is where you do the configuration. I can override that in line as well. And sort of at the bottom, I have pig runner that does exactly that. I point it to a script, specify the parameters, and then uh, execute them again pig. What's interesting here is you can see how now I actually have a small workflow. Also there in the middle I have what is called here HDFS script. That's a groovy script that I mentioned earlier where I'm just preparing the input and the output. So now all these different three command lines, first uh, creating the pig server, second creating the actual script, and then executing the pig script itself are actually defined in a declarative fashion as beans here. Uh, all the runners here in Spring for Apache Hadoop give you this pre or post action, so you can actually have this small workflow. You can say, before executing this, execute this other thing. So I can now have this nice chain, and based on my uh, settings, decide how big I want it to go. You can also use things that are already available. Right? Scheduling has been available for a long time. So while you can use pig runner and run things on demand as startup, you can also say, well, I want to do scheduling. So what we're doing there is just injecting our pig runner, because all the runners implement the GDK callable interface, and say, well, either I have when I, the user basically clicks onto something, or me as an administrator, to start the actual pig execution, or potentially I can use scheduling itself, right? And here I can use anything from a GDK execution listener to Quartz, or a working manager implementation is entirely up to you, right? If you want to, think, to do things uh, in a programmatic fashion, uh, we support that as well. Uh, we offer you a peak template, and those of you that are familiar with Spring and templating in general probably already know what I'm talking about here. Uh, this is a basic configuration I'm defining Hadoop, uh, the peak factory, the template, and what I have here is this code. This is just, again, a Java class. I'm creating the templates, setting out the, uh, my peak script, and then doing the execution. And this code here looks trivial, and that's exactly the point. The idea of where do I get the Hadoop configuration, how do I create the pick script, how do I create a new instance, how do I connect to it, all that is taken care of inside execute script. And also all the exceptions coming from pig or Hadoop are translated to data access exceptions, so I don't have to catch them right away. I have unchecked exceptions that actually have a meaningful um, message that I can use. Now, similar to pig, a uh, popular tool is Hive. Hive actually gives you a query language, so you can actually use SQL. It's not a one-to-one -one mapping, but for the most part, it does a trick. So the same example of counting words looks something like this. This is probably the shortest example, even though Hive itself usually tend to uh, be quite verbose. So what we're doing here is, again, reading information from HDFS into our application, and then creating this sort of nested query. What we're doing is, we're taking each line, and then for each line, we're going to explore, we're going to 
take each entry, going to split it by spaces so we have the words, and then for each word is going to do a group by, and then for each group we're going to do the counting. So a hive, just like pig, is going to take this, take this uh, operator, is going to break down behind the scenes into a lot of scripts, uh, or sorry, map to scripts, we're going to send them to the cluster. And even though this looks like SQL, it's not going to take, um, I don't know, two seconds or you know, 30 seconds as you're used to a database, but actually it's going to take a minimum, if, if you just do a select count one, it's going to take anything for 30 seconds. Why? Because you have a compiler sort of that does all this work, you have the dispatch uh, done to the Hadoop cluster, and then you have to get the results back. Everything with Hadoop is meant for big data. And even if you just query for tiny amount of data, uh, Hadoop does all the preparation to handle with a lot of load. In terms of um, Hive usage, you have two main uh, entry points. You can either, again, use a command line and basically specify your scripts and any parameters, or you can use, due to its SQL nature, what is, looks like a JDBC-based approach. You just specify the driver, potentially a half-specific URL, and that's it. Everything there on that slide is just pure JDBC. So you do the try, prepare, create statement, prepare statement, run it, get the results set, and use that. And most people actually tend to prefer that because it gives you an already existing path that you typically know to interact with big data. Uh, with, now, if you have to put Spring into the mix, it's basically quite simple. Um, you can just use the Spring JDBC template. Um, the same example here, uh, where I'm just taking the Hive driver, wrapping it with a simple driver data source because a driver manager inside the JDK leaks uh, that was just pointed out uh, previously. And then you can just wire that into a JDBC template. So I can you know, do one-liner queries to do select counts for tables, things like that, or I can do, use the uh, query infrastructure to do this lightweight POJO mapping features to get the results back. And again, all the exception handling and all the low-level details are handled for me. Besides GDBC, what you can use is the native or vanilla Hive client, where basically you interrogate the server uh, and run an actual native query, so there is no translation from GDBC to the actual commands. Uh, this one is based on Thrift, which is a remote uh, uh, protocol, and unfortunately, it tends to be quite verbose. This is the select count statement, how it looks like in Hive. There are two things that we're doing here. Again, Hive, just like pig, is not thread safe. So every time I want to do something on each thread, I have to create a new instance, which means I have to carry all the configuration information along with me so I can run the actual query. And then once I have to do that, because I'm using Hive, which underneath uses a Thrift to communicate with Hadoop, I tend to basically end up with three types of exceptions, from Hadoop, from Thrift, and then from Hive as well. So you end up with a lot of boilerplate code. And obviously, this is something that can be simplified, and this is exactly what we've done with Spring for Apache Hadoop. So first of all, you get nice declarative configuration, one-liner. That's it. We take care of creating new instances on demand if you need. And also, a nice side effect is we allow you to create a Hive server as well. So rather than getting to the command line and starting the server manually and then shutting it down, you can just create that within your application. This is quite nice when, whenever you do testing or whenever you do move to a different environment because you don't have to get out of your jar to do something, but rather just have the Hive jar with you start it automatically with your application and shutting it down. This is something that we use a lot uh, ourselves for testing. And then for the declarative usage, it's quite simple. You can just specify the script there or refer to it automatically. In terms of programmatic usage, where you want to do things on demand, where you want to actually write code, potentially dynamic, again, we give you the Hive template. The same story, right? A template that does all the handling for you, all the configuration, so all you have to do is basically specify what you want things to happen, right? You can do one-liners, like query for long, similar to JDBC template, or you can actually specify the parameters. Now, another interesting library, um, quite popular, between Hive and Pig, uh, inside the big data world is cascading. Now, the previous two were actually using query or declarative a scripting styles, right? You have a data flow language or SQL. Now, this one is based on Java. So what you have here are higher level abstractions or operations that you can apply onto your data. This is similar to sort of pig in that you have a data flow, but rather than being used on tables or views, cascading is based on tuples. That is, as your data comes in, you can decide to ignore some tuples, potentially create new ones, and as your data flows in, apply different operations to it until you actually get to your end. So what I'm doing here is, again, counting words, cascading style. So at the top, I'm setting up uh, the input and the output 
sort of the source and the sink. Again, these are just, if you like, virtual endpoints for my flow. And then I'm creating what is called a pipe, applying a regular expression to chop the lines into words. Um, for each, applying the regular expression is going to create new tuples, and then for each tuple, which is going to end up with my words because I'm taking the line, getting into a regular expression, breaking that line into actual words, and then for each word, which is basically a string, I'm going to uh, do a group by, so I'm going to separate them, have each group, and then for each group I'm going to do a counting. Notice that I don't have to write MapReduce. Again, cascading does this for me, so I just have to specify its building blocks, which in this case would be each group by every and regex. So for a Java developer, cascading tends to be nicer because rather than writing a new script or potentially having to deal with SQL again, I can just write everything from Java. Um, what we can do in Spring for Apache Hadoop is use Java-based configuration in Spring. Now, with the previous two examples, Hive and Pig, because everything is declarative and sits outside, XML tends to be a nice match. But in case of uh, Cascading, because it's Java-based, a strong type Java-based configuration makes sense. This is what uh, obviously you get with Spring. So what I've done here is rather than having your entire infrastructure into one big chunk of code, you can just split it into reusable parts, which is something that the Cascading team recommends as well. So I can have my regular expression, into defined as one bean, and then I can have my counting bean as well uh, defined separate. So now I can uh, work with these different beans and potentially reuse them in other flow without having to rewrite the entire configuration again. So it's very modularized. So I can have all that inside one uh, Java configuration and then wire that in just for the sake of argument through XML here uh, underneath. Uh, with cascading, and again, notice that I'm sharing the same Hadoop configuration between Hive, Pig, and cascading as well. I don't have to redo it again. So if you have to look sort of at a big picture, right, now that you have core Hadoop, um, you have different tasks, and typically you cannot just say, well, I'm going to count words and that's it. Typically within your application, you end up with different tasks. Some of them might be even triggered by different events. So for example, you can start counting the words, and then for each word, you're going to index some uh, books and potentially make some summaries and then push that out. So you end up with different jobs, maybe even different types, depending on what tools you, you have to use that have to be somehow orchestrated. Um, Within the Spring sort of environment, a great solution for that is Spring Batch. Why? Because it's a framework that does exactly that. Batch by itself is not sexy, right? It's the sort of do while, so why exactly can you have a framework for that? Well, typically because you have to deal with failure. When a job takes where your do while um, loop takes somewhere not 10 minutes, but let's say two months. If you have a minor exception, right, when you're processing billions of trillions of rows, if one of them potentially has a mistake or potentially the network goes down, you don't want to just abort your job and then start all over because maybe you're at the end of it. Or maybe that exception wasn't necessarily critical. So you typically have things like, okay, ignore this exception because it's fine. Or ignore this entry because it's just one entry out of million. Or potentially if I have five more exceptions, then I can say, well, this particular entry is corrupt, so I want to ignore it. And this is where your do while starts to become a, a bit more complex than that, right? You need rules. And this is what exactly Spring Batch gives you. Now, Hadoop, for the most part, is just an implementation, not necessarily for batching, but for doing analysis on big data. So there is a nice match be be between saying having batch jobs, different, top, different types, whether I'm reading for files to a racial database, or in this case, Hadoop. So what I can have here is say, well, I have my... Um, um, sort of batch job, again, this is something generic, and I want to use it on Hadoop. That is, all the jobs I'm going to execute are going to reside on Hadoop. So I have here this trivial um, workflow where I'm reading data from HDFS, pushing it into pig, then in parallel I want to execute a, a Hadoop map reduce and then hive, and then write the result back for each of them in HDFS. So what you can get with Spring for Hadoop and Batch is if you're looking at all these different steps, the seven steps that I said that typically you have from a data pipeline, is well for collecting Batch is excellent outside Hadoop necessarily to just uh, get your files and then push them out. For transformation, you can do a lot of that, such as aggregation. For real-time analysis with batching, you don't really have an answer because this is batching, right? This is the opposite of real-time. But for ingest running things to HDFS, again, you have a lot of support, and in particular, the batch orchestration that I just mentioned before in order to coordinate, orchestrate your different jobs on Hadoop, whether you want to use entirely on Hadoop or you just want to interact with HDFS. And the same for distribution. So, for example, getting back to our um, 
workflow there, this is how a Spring Batch job would look like. I'm defining the job, import, work count, pig, and then in parallel I'm defining the MR step hive and then writing everything to HDFS. And this is just a description for it. Incidentally, we have a lot of support for Spring Batch in Spring Source Tool Suite, so you can actually visualize it. But if you look at this, this is just a description of a job. There is nothing Hadoop specific here, right? There is nothing outside my job. This is just a high level view of how my workflow looks like. But the nice thing here is if you put in Spring for Apache Hadoop, you can actually have that each job be an actual step. So you can actually just wire in a Hadoop within your job, within your infrastructure, without having to rewrite a lot of code and actually reuse all the components that we've talked about it today, such as a script task, like to execute a script to interact with HDFS, uh, work count to do the actual work counting. This is an actual MapReduce job and then pig and Hive, our actual tasklet. A tasklet is the spring batch basic unit of work, and we support that across all the components, all the other runners that I've mentioned before. You also get, as a nice side effect, the spring batch admin, so you also uh, get some nice UI so you can look at your jobs, abort them, see what's wrong with them, potentially retry them, things like that. So you have now a nice way of coordinating your different jobs and orchestrating them within Hadoop. Um, I mentioned that Hadoop by itself doesn't exist as a standalone island, because typically you have a lot of data that you have to move inside Hadoop in order to do the analysis and then get that out. So typically you end up with a classical um, event-driven um, system. Why? Because you have different data sources that create different data, and that data needs to be pushed in, and then you have to push the data out. So if you look from mixing Hadoop with Spring and integrated integration patterns, you typically, if you look at the steps, you have excellent support for collecting data because you have different type of adapters, different type of support for the various uh, sources out there. The same goes for doing distribution when you have to push data out. A nice transformation as it goes in line, but also support for real-time analysis. This is something that you can do by providing your own code, potentially writing to stores like a key, a value stores like Redis or MongoDB documents, increment counters, but also you can send them to things like Gemfire whenever you, or in-memory databases whenever you have a lot of spikes of data and you want to integrate, um, do continuous queries, that is, have queries executed on a, on a working window, or even use as per you know, actual um, processing engines or even Storm, right? You can use Spring integration to do the routing there and getting the results out. And the same goes for ingest as well whenever you have this spike of events happening. And unfortunately, I'm running out of time. This is what happens when uh, you get 10 minutes out of your session. Um, just an example, um, you know, to, to plant the seed here, common pattern that you have with Hadoop is, well, I have a lot of um, servers, I have a lot of logs, so I want to aggregate them, and then every night potentially look at it and figure out how much data I have, what are um, the various users out there, what are the um, different uh, hot items on my application. And typically, if you break that down, you have different uh, sources where you just pull things for data, and then you copy those files over, aggregate them, run a query, uh, whether when you have, let's say, 100 um, files or potentially, you know, um, midnight has arrived. So if you have to break down what you end up with an integration platform, it is literally building blocks that you could just assemble as Lego. So what I'm doing here, I'm just reusing the pipes and aggregators and adapters from Spring Integration, which is based on Enterprise Integration Platform book by Gary Hoffby. So literally, you can take that ad literum and apply it with Spring Integration, and I end up with this, building blocks, right? I have a file and adapter, to look at my files and then send them to a gateway that is going to send them to HDFS. This is where I can plug in Fringo for Apache Hadoop or the adapter to write to HDFS. Once um, I have enough files, I can do transformation there, potentially eliminate all the sensitive information if I have any things like uh, credit card information. And once I have within my aggregator, that is in my threshold there, enough information, let's say enough data or potentially time has passed, I can actually run my MapReduce job. So I can now expose Hadoop within my application as well. I can, another common case is syslog to HDFS. I have a lot of events and I want to write them to um, my HDFS, to my big data store. Again, integration, an integration problem. I have the same building blocks and for the most part the same chain, but what I'm doing there at the end in the using potentially a key value adapter like Redis, but then pushing all the information again to HDFS. And sort of the last example, typically when you have to scale because it's big data, you tend to scale, is having not just one machine where you have to do aggregation or potentially do the dispatch, but rather multiple machines. And this is something that we can very easily extend to because 
Again, it's the same chain. I can just modify the input. This is what I'm interested in. So rather than doing collecting from only one machine, I can do it from multiple machines and then have the entry as one, um, one gate, which is a TCP outbound and inbound for doing big data. So I believe um, I'm running out of time. I believe I still have um, five minutes or six minutes there. Um, I know I've been through a lot of information here, um, a lot of books. Uh, this is sort of, sort of where we stand with Spring for Apache Hadoop. We have GA coming, um, Apache license, just like all the rest of Spring projects. You can find it on GitHub, as well as the example that I mentioned. Uh, we have actually a book you can find it on our stand. Spring Data talks about big data, has dedica dedicated chapter. All the authors are part of the Spring Data team, and also you have chapters on Redis, uh, MongoDB, Neo4j as well. And if you're interested in batch and integration as well, we have plenty of books for that as well. Probably you know about that as well. So, yes, we still have five minutes. If you, have, if you guys have any questions, uh, start shooting. Okay, yes, one question there, yes? So the question is, does it make sense to use Spring Hadoop within Amazon EMR? Uh, yes, it does. Basically, um, um, Amazon EMR is just a target, f um, is just right, a on-demand Hadoop. So whether you um, have things installed on your machine, in a virtual machine, on a cloud, in your environment, outside, that's fine. We actually even have for uh, um, inside our documentation dedicated chapter with Apache World and Apache Amazon EMR. Uh, you can do two things. You can either send all the code there to run inside Amazon EMR or you can just open the cluster and then just submit jobs on demand. This is what most people tend to do because typically the data sits there, your application sits within your hosting environment and then you just want to send triggers such as execute this job or execute this um, job runner there. We, for the most part, Spring Data or Spring for Apache doesn't interfere with your cluster. So all, all that I've seen are actually just directives to the cluster. But there is no Spring for Apache Hadoop at runtime being deployed within your cluster. You're not going to see that in the stack trace because we're just an orchestrator, if you want, same as Spring Batch. We don't interfere with the job types. For, so for the most part, you have your jobs, whether they are jar, hive, pig, whether you want to use the declarative approach or not. That's entirely fine. And obviously, the same applies for Amazon EMR, which is just a hosting environment. So the answer is definitely yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, Peter wants so me to read. We're giving away free copies of the Spring Data Book at the booth. Uh, we're all out of hoodies because everyone has done the uh, um, Hello World Challenge. Uh, so thanks for that. We pretty much have uh, a bunch of pretty, yeah, we're, we're pretty much out of giveaways in terms of the hoodies at the booth. Uh, but you can get copies of the Spring Data Book that Costin was just talking about. Uh, this is pretty much the only giveaways we have left, so we are going to throw them at you for anyone that wants them. They're bamboo socks with a little Spring Source logo. Um, please feel free to continue asking uh, Costin questions while we're throwing socks at you. You're right. <laughs> that is going to work out, yeah. All right, so since, yeah, Peter is going to th uh, start throwing hooks or socks. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I'm down by the booth. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.